what I wanted to do today, I was told I got two hours, I got 84 slides, that seems totally doable. <laughs> and so I like to start my presentations with a joke. I got 36 slides in 50 minutes. Um, maybe a little ambitious, but I think we'll get through it. Um, I titled this talk, um, A Glance at My Approach to Teaching, and I am not good at titling things. Um, Rich and I talk about that all the time. We just can't figure it out, a good title. And so I would try to think about, okay, all the ways that I try to help my students, and there's so many facets to it, and I'm sure you guys recognize that. And so this is just a glance. I'm gonna try to give you uh, a demonstration, if you will, and then um, hopefully we can find connections to what you guys do in your classrooms. We can see how, even though we're maybe in different fields, we employ um, similar topics or similar tactics. And then we'll see what happens. And then I got some cool toys up here that we're gonna use throughout the day also. So, um, so here we go. Um, a little bit about myself, um, just kind of FYI, that was a great intro. So I did my bachelor's at the University of Delaware. I have a PhD in inorganic chemistry from KU. Um, and I was trained as a synthetic organometallic and inorganic chemist. Um, I am not in education, and that's my disclaimer. The things I do and I'm gonna talk about, that's what works for me in my classrooms. Um, some of the stuff I do might not work in other chemistry classrooms, and it might not work in your field. Um, but there are some similar overlaps. I'm gonna try to highlight those throughout the day from things that I learned at our last brown bag lunch. And so, um, just bear with me. These are things I do in my classroom. And I just wanted to kind of be clear on that. And so, um, I was a visiting assistant professor in Ohio for two years after grad school. I've been here, this is my fourth year. My life has a bird theme. Uh, my high school was a blue jay. My undergrad was a blue hen. Um, graduate school was the Jayhawk. And when I was in Ohio, they were the Eagles. And so I don't know what's going on with that. It just kind of worked out that way. But they're very pretty campuses if you ever visit. I wanted to give you a little bit of background about what we do um, in the Department of Chemistry and Physics. And so our typical workload um, is 14 contact hours per week. That's all the scientists, what we teach. And so that usually breaks down to two lectures and three labs every semester. Uh, we hold six office hours a week. These are all the different courses um, that I am the instructor of record on. And so sounds like we're maybe more to come. Who knows, right? We'll see what opportunities grow. And then uh, in the classroom, my teaching style is more of a mixture of traditional lecture and active learning. And so what I would try to do, and I'm gonna try to give you a flavor of that today. Um, I like to explain topics to the students. The science is new, it's dense. And so it's our job, I think, to break it down. I see myself as more of a tour guide. And so I try to take the students through a journey, try to explain to them, okay, this is what we're doing. This is what it means. This is how we do it. But also, this is why it's important. And so I'll explain them the topic, we'll talk about something. I'm always gonna do practice problems. I'm gonna have some, you'll notice there's a handout in front of you. We're gonna do some work today. Um, and I'll try to do some active learning things like think, pair, share. So depending on the topic, I'll have my students either, hey, try this on your own, I need you to know this and be able to do this quickly by yourself. But there's other topics, um, I did one today in class this morning. Um, this is kind of challenging and this is like a six step process. Um, there's a lot of math and concepts, so I want you to work with somebody and try to figure it out together. And then we always come back together. I always do the problems with them, how I would approach them. We always talk about solutions. Um, and I try to give them little tricks along the way to make their lives easier. Um, so these are all the classes that we do, um, that I do. Of course, there's way more in our department. Um, I wanted to also break it down by enrollment to kind of give you an idea of the size of classes that we're working with. So all of our labs are capped at 24 due to safety reasons. So whether they're lower level labs, upper level labs, right? We don't let any more than 24. Our lower level lectures, things like survey of chemistry for the allied health or students taking area D classes, um, our principles of chemistry more for the STEM majors, they're, you know, we're hitting 50 students in a class. And that changes, you know, 40 to 60, it depends on the semester, who's available to cover the class or how many professors, how many sections can we have. And so that kind of jumps around. Of course, if you go from like the first semester to the second semester, some students don't need the class, right? So maybe the uh, enrollment drops, things like that. Um, I try to take internship students and research students, but I try to limit myself. Um, these are a lot of time intensive projects. And so I try to limit myself to one or two students every semester. And I've had chemistry majors, biology majors, um, chemistry majors in my lab. And then of course, I also get to teach my specialty in organic chemistry. There are five disciplines of chemistry, right? And so I'm only one fifth of the puzzle, right? And so we all work together to make a cumulative project and we all help each other out. And so, of course, right, you get smaller and smaller classes as you go up, but because the classes are so big, when we hit the lower level courses, it's hard to do anything but more kind of traditional lecture mixed in with active learning. And so, some semesters we build 
in recitations into the schedule and maybe we can cut the class in half and maybe have 30 students that we can do an hour of work with a semester or sorry a week but even still it's kind of hard to do um, small things because it's just hard to bounce around and help everybody with whatever they need in a 50 minute window and so that's why I try to do the more traditional lecturing and so what I would do um, I'm gonna see this gear symbol throughout the day I'm gonna change gears a couple times just so you know we're gonna jump um, kind of a break here and so I give my students a to-do list, and we talk about this on day one of the semester. Every class I teach, I like to talk about a to-do list. And the biggest thing here um, I tell my students is, great, we're going to throw all this material at you. You need to know X, Y, Z by the time you graduate, because these are the things that are important. But yeah, you have a lot to learn. But the hardest thing about college is not learning the material. It's learning how to learn the material. And that's the hardest thing for my students. And so we're going to learn how to learn. And so. Um, I do this kind of list on day one. Students might come to me in my office, say, hey, Dr. Myers, my first exam didn't go that well. Or I'm really struggling on this homework. Can you help me? And I'm going to ask, well, how did you prepare for that exam? Right? What did you do when you were taking the, doing the problem sets online or something? And so I'm going to give them some tips. And so I bring a little bit of psychology. Any psychologists in the room today? A couple people, OK. All right, this is for you. <laughs> and so, um, what I like to do is I tell my students, it's really important you reread your notes. You've got to rewrite your notes. Um, and you're going to do that the same day as lecture. You're going to read the book before you come to the next lecture. You're going to make definition note cards before the next lecture. And so I bring up human psychology. We're only able as humans to source, store so much information in our short-term memory. And so I bring up the idea of immersion. And if you see the material multiple times, it's more likely going to transition to long-term memory. Um, and I think it's eight bits of knowledge is what a human can remember. Short-term memory? That sounds right. <laughs> Say again? Four. Four. I was overestimating. Four bits of knowledge. All right. Um, thank you. <laughs> and so, not a psychologist. And so, um, the idea is immersion, learning, just seeing it over and over and over. You kind of got to drill that in. Um, I give problem sets online. We use the publisher's uh, homework system. You got to start those right away. And right? so you got to start working on them to see what you know and see what's stuck. If you don't know, please ask questions. It's amazing how many students will burn all their attempts at a question, still don't get it, and then they come to me. And I'm like, well, why don't you just use one or two attempts? Come in, we'll talk about it. Right? Um, I always give students practice problems before graded problems. So let's try the practice problems. We'll do those together. I'll help you get the answer. And I'll let you try the graded one to see if you got it or not. Um, and then I recommend students rework the problem sets. Again, it's just over and over and over. And so I'll share stories from my life, how I lived in a library for four years, right, and all those things. But the idea, um, what I've noticed a lot with students taking exams, is they don't always prepare correctly. And that's the learning how to learn idea. And so I like to remind them, all right, look, when you're in there on exam day, you have a calculator. I'll give you a periodic table and maybe a formula sheet. So you got to practice with those things, right? An athlete does not go into a game without going um, to practice, right? So why would you go into a mental exam, mental exercise, and not practice that way? And so when I kind of point those out, students kind of see, oh, that makes more sense, right? And so then they start trying those things. I bring up mock lecturing, because you and I know teaching is a fantastic way to learn. I tell them, please ask questions, right? Do you not know something? Or maybe, hey, Dr. Myers, I understand we learned this today. Did I get it right? right? Those are good questions. I like to encourage all types of questions. And then I say provide feedback. These are things that work for me. Um, these are things I've seen that have worked for my students over the years I've been a faculty member. But you've got to let me know, and then I can help you fine tune your study habits. And so what I really like about this when I do this, I do it on paper, and I have terrible handwriting. And so I'm going to spare you from that today. But I had a student last semester. I was walking around the class. We were doing problems. And I see her binder. And you know that plastic sleeve thing they have in front of the binders? She had this list, my handwritten list, right there. That was the thing she always saw when she carried her binder around. And that meant a lot to me. And so I get positive feedback about this. They usually come at the end of the semester, say, hey, thank you for the study tips. That was really helpful. And I go, hey, this works in all classes, not just chemistry. So don't forget. Right? So um, I also do this on the first day of class. So I actually give them a top 10 list of how to pass the class. So I try to be positive and promote. Um, but you'll notice a lot of the things here are going to be what's on the last slide. Come to class. Please take your notes and rewrite your notes. Don't study only the notes. All right, please make sure you read the book. Please make sure you give yourself time to do the homework. Please make sure you rework the homework. Make sure you practice on your own. Do not cram. It's amazing how many students like to do a problem set, start it like the three hours before it's due when I've given them a week. All right, and so you've got to spread those things out. 
Yeah, right? Um, it takes time to process, right? You're not a machine. You can't just look at something and memorize unless you have, you're lucky enough to have an eidetic memory, right? It takes time to figure those things out. Um, and so I like to remind them, um, don't forget to ask for help, even if you aren't confused or lost. And then please make sure you ask questions. So I always say that twice. Ask for help if you need something. Um, and so these are my pieces of advice. I do this on day one. And so this is kind of the background I just wanted to throw out there. Are there any questions so far? I do this a bunch. Dominic. Quick question. Uh, uh, do you find that people actually read the book? Some of them do. Some, yeah. Just, yeah. I, I sometimes tell my students, uh, I'm happy to buy the book. Yes. Like, please buy yeah. the book for the step one. Yeah, buying the book is, a, is step one. Okay. Um, <laughs> some students do, some students don't. It depends. Science books are so dense and they're so heavy that a lot of times they just kind of get turned off by them. And I remind them, like, okay, we're only doing maybe one or two sections of the book. It's only maybe five to eight pages of reading, right? And so some, they, some do it, some don't, and that's okay. Um, at the lower levels, I track the book pretty closely in my lecture, and so I don't stray that far from what the author is talking about. So um, they can kind of get away with both. So. Are there any other questions? Yes, ma'am. The first day, uh, yeah, I will show them chemical structures and we'll talk about some things. I bring up the definition of chemistry, how it's the study of structure, properties, transformations of matter. Um, but I also have to cover the syllabus, so I can't get too far. But day two, we start going in depth into what the definition of chemistry is. Okay. But yeah, um, in the upper level, I'll breeze through the syllabus and I'll just start talking about quantum mechanics the first day. So it just depends on the class. Yeah. Anything else? Lively discussion. I'll give you both three points for volunteering. Thank you. All right, so what I wanted to do, I'm going to switch gears here. Um, and I'd like to switch over. I'm going to move into teaching mode. And I was trying to think again, how do I share what I do? And I thought the best way would be with an example. And so I'm going to give you guys a little lecture on chemistry. One is self-serving. I like chemistry. It makes me feel better. Um, and two, I can share some chemistry, force it on you, because now you're all stuck in the room. Right? Um, but then maybe I can show you some of my approaches to doing problem solving. So I like to ask this question on day one. How many people in the last five years have taken a chemistry class at the college level? And I just want you to just look around. All right. This is normally what my classes look like. Okay. This is pretty typical. And so I'm going to do something little. We're just going to talk about the atom. All right. And I want to kind of share with you how I have a classroom like this where people haven't taken chemistry in a while or maybe they've never taken chemistry. How do you approach that topic? So, I'll ask another question, show of hands, how many people are scared when they hear chemistry? It scares the crap out of me, right? <laughs> um, but I like to tell the students, right, we're going to do this together. We're a group, right? We're going to get through it. I'm your tour guide. I'm going to walk you through, and we'll figure it out together. And so if you're willing to put in the time, I am. You guys are here, so let's do this thing, right? So I got a meme up here. I like to start with a meme. I do this on day one. Doctor, do you recommend a chemical-free diet? The patient responds only if you like, or sorry, nope. The patient says, doctor, do you recommend a chemical-free diet? The doctor responds, only if you'd like to starve to death. Um, scientists excluded. Can somebody please tell me, what do you think about this meme? Is the doctor being facetious, or is he truthful? Do you consider political science a science? Am I allowed to answer? You can answer. I can answer, OK. Uh, the doctor is being truthful, because uh, when, we say, when people say, oh, I'm afraid of chemicals in my food and stuff, everything's a chemical. Exactly, and that's the key point. I'll give you four points. Everything around you. <laughs> when you look, the marker on the, you write on the board with, this controller I'm holding, the phone in your pocket, the jeans that you're wearing, the skin that you have, right? These are all made of chemicals, right? And so if you were to come up and tell me I'm a bag of chemicals and you think it's an insult, that's actually a fact, okay? Um, everything around you is a chemical. Now, there are good chemicals and bad chemicals is how we kind of think about them. But really, it all comes down to dosage, right? How much chemical are you exposed to is the problem. And so I'm going to try to illustrate some of those examples here. So a uh, good gentleman named John Dalton, an Englishman, um, came up with what he calls the atomic theory. And so all matter is made of atoms, right? And so the atom that he figures out from work like people like Provost and Lavoisier, um, Dalton, they put this all together, and they realize there's a building block for, uh, building block for all matter around us. And that building block is the atom. It is a little sphere, right? It's the building block. And so just like you would build this building from bricks, right? The brick is the building block, right? We're going to use atoms for matter. Now, no matter what sample you take, no matter what chemical you have, if it's pure and it's only that one type of thing, 
all of those atoms of one type of an element will have the same exact properties. Every atom of oxygen is going to do the same thing as its neighbor, no matter what happens. Um, so these are some properties Dalton enlightens us with. And then we can scale up. There are 90 naturally occurring elements, depending on who you talk to, but there's about 90. And so that would be pretty boring for life if we only had 90 things in the universe. And so we want diversity. And so what we can do is we can start combining atoms into what we call compounds. And so the work of people like um, Dalton, uh, sorry, of Lavoisier, who recognize things like the law of definite proportions, recognizes the fact that atoms are little things. They come together in whole number ratios. So you're going to have one of this and one of that, or two of this and one of that. Right? We never get fractions. Right? You don't build a house from quarters of bricks. We don't build matter from quarters of atoms. Right? And then we can do chemical reactions. And so we're going to scale up. We're going to start small with the atom. How does it all begin? We're going to build something a little bigger, a compound. We're going to put those atoms together. And then once we have those objects, we can then start bashing them together and let them do chemical reactions. And then we can make all new things, right? um, simply put. So the atom itself is a beautiful idea. This is the accepted atomic structure today. And so you'll notice it's a little hard to see, but there's a giant blue circle. The atom is a sphere. I want you to think about it as a ball within a ball. Right? So the big ball itself is the whole atom. That little ball sits right in the middle, and we call that the nucleus, and that sits at the center. And so that nucleus is important because it contains two what we call subatomic particles, a proton and a neutron. Um, and so we have blue spheres and red spheres. And those particles give mass, right? When you pick up an object and you can feel it, right? Something really heavy must have a lot of protons and neutrons in it, right? Because just that's how matter works. But that nucleus is surrounded with kind of this blue, uh, lighter blue thing. We call that the electron cloud. So we have these little particles that go around the center sphere, right? And we call that an electron. And so I want to kind of put this in perspective in terms of the size. Um, 10 to the negative 10 meters. I want you to imagine a meter. That's about three feet long, OK? I want you to cut that meter into 10 billion pieces, 10 billion. Each little piece is about the size of an average atom. Right? And so these things are incredibly tiny. But what's even cooler is all the mass of matter, the things that we can feel when we pick something up. That mass originates from that little sphere. That little sphere is one one hundred thousandth the size of the big sphere. Right? So the atom itself is a hundred thousand times bigger than that little sphere. And that little sphere contains most of the mass of the things around you. Right? And so that's kind of a weird thing to think about. Um, but it's true. Right? And so this is our accepted structure. Um, I should note, I gave you guys handouts. I have all my slides there. Um, and so this, I kind of like to transition in case you wanted to follow along, because there is a quiz. All right. But it's a group quiz. That's OK. I don't give my slides to my students in advance, because I don't know what I'm going to cover that day. Right? It just depends on how far we get. But I do post all my lecture slides on D2L afterwards. So I do most of my work on the board. And so for example, you'll notice down here, I would actually write these things on the board. I practice note taking skills. I teach them shortcuts, abbreviations, how to shorthand stuff. Um, and that way they become good note takers. That way if they're listening, they're not spending a lot of time writing so they can get more information down. Um, so for example, I might show a table like this on the slide because it just has some information. I, maybe I don't want to take the time for them to write that. But the important thing, such as what's down here in blue, I would force them to write. I'm going to write that on the board because I write, they write. Right? And that way I know they're at least studying the definitions. All right, so, all right, let me come back into it. So, we got three subatomic particles. We have a proton, a neutron, and an electron. I will remind you that the proton and neutron live in the nucleus. That's the little ball and the big ball. The electron, or the electrons, go around the nucleus. And that gives us the overall size of the atom. We use symbols. So I do a lot of symbols and variables throughout the semester to shortcut stuff. So for example, instead of writing the word concentration on the board, I would just write two square brackets. And the students know that means concentration. And so we start learning shortcuts. But here's the cool part. Every particle has its own fundamental properties. They have mass, right? So you'll notice the electron is a lot smaller in mass than the neutron and proton. The proton has a positive one electrical charge, just based on how it's developed and how it's formed. And so I like to remember that. I like to give little tricks. The proton has a positive charge. They both start with P, right? So let's lock that down, right? The electron has a negative one charge. So I put a little negative sign in the symbol. That way we forget it's a negative charge. And the neutron has a no charge. It's a neutral species. Right? So these are our three particles. 
for chemists, this is the lowest level, protons, neutrons, and electrons. You talk to a particle physics, uh, particle physicist, and there's way more stuff in the atom. Um, this is as low as we're going to go. But what's interesting, it's the interplay of these particles that gives rise to the properties of the stuff around us. Right? How many protons, neutrons, and electrons you combine alter everything around you. Right? And that's a pretty powerful idea. So if we can get that down and we understand the structure of the atom, we can start understanding how atoms combine into compounds, how compounds react in reactions and changes. And then you can start moving to more complicated systems like biochemistry, um, or how in your body you use all these complicated chemical uh, reactions. And so it starts with simple matter. Right? And so I try to do this in a logical order from small to big. Right? And that way maybe we don't miss anything. So um, I'm going to give you guys a definition. Anytime I underline a word, that is a definition. So an element. Um, we have 90 naturally occurring elements. We have 118 elements known to date that have been confirmed by IUPAC. Um, an element, in the simplest way, this is the best I could get the definition, it is a pure substance that cannot be broken down into anything simpler. The element is the building block. So you'll notice in front of you, you guys have the peri uh, periodic table of elements. Um, this is your copy. You're welcome. All right. It's a Friday gift. And so I give something like this to my students, except it's bigger so they can take notes on it. But the idea here is this periodic table, when you look at this, how many people just say a collection of numbers and letters, just to show a hand? One honest person. I'll give you three points for being honest. Right? It looks just like letters and numbers, but a true chemist understands that this is a book. And so I tell my students, we're going to unlock secrets. If you can look at this and you can start identifying information, all of a sudden, right, there's a world of knowledge locked in this table. And so I'm going to give you one of those pieces of information today. Um, the identity of any element, right? We have 90 elements. The identity of that element is based on the number of proto uh, protons that live in the nucleus. And so I would actually write this in blue on the board. Does anybody know the three, tri uh, three dots in a triangle? Sierra? Therefore. It means therefore. I got two students back there. Thank you for coming. <laughs> Shout out to you guys. I'll give you plus 10 points. And so um, I use a lot of abbreviations. So this means, therefore, the identity of an uh, element is based on the number of protons that thing holds. Um, and we call that the atomic number. And so when you're looking at your periodic table, right, that integer number there right, tells you the identity. Now, instead of calling the elements oh, element 2 or element 71, right, we give them names. So we, think, we know things like carbon or hydrogen or oxygen. The other thing I can tell you is if you have an atom off the periodic table, it turns out that the number of protons in the nucleus is the same number of electrons going around the nucleus. Right? And so that's a basic property of matter. Okay? So your number of protons equals your number of electrons. So I wanted to play a game here with you guys, and I want your help. And this is literally something I do in my lecture. We're just going to shout it out. All right? So I'm going to ask you guys, um, can somebody tell me the symbol of element carbon? C. C, OK. Can somebody give me the symbol for hydrogen? H. H. There we go. We're getting louder. All right. Oxygen? O. Ah, there it is. Plus five points. Nitrogen? N. Ten. There's plus ten points. Right? See, you do more. You get more points. It's a good thing. All right? So what I can tell you, these um, atoms are incredibly important. They combine into molecules. And these molecules are a key to life. They give biodiversity. Um, so maybe you want to talk to the biochemist or the biologist about that after class. Um, but we call them organic molecules. These are carbon-based molecules where they contain a carbon-hydrogen bond. Humans, for example, have three macromolecules you need to survive. There are carbohydrates, you have proteins, and you have lipids, right? So carbohydrates are things like sugars or fibers. Um, proteins, you're thinking like muscles, meats, okay? And then you have your lipids, those are your fats, right? We need these things to survive as humans. These elements can combine in a lot of different ratios in different ways with sometimes other elements. And that gives us diversity to life. Right? And that's a really powerful thing because we go from having 90 elements to now we have over 30 million organic compounds. And that's a lot of things. Okay? And so that's a big deal for us. Right? All right. Playing a game, can somebody tell me the symbol for calcium? Yeah. Very good. All right. In the body, where would you find calcium? Bones. Bones and teeth. I used to tell my neighbors when they were little kids, tell your mom you need to eat ice cream because there's calcium. It's good for your bones. And then they would run over. Right. And then I would get in trouble, but I thought it was funny because um, you got these little cute little girls running to their mom. I need ice cream. <laughs> um, all right. I'm going to give you the symbol P. Does anybody know that element? It's phosphorus. Very good. In the body, does anybody know where you find phosphorus? 
It's in your bones, and I heard it. It's in your DNA, right? Um, if I give you something like F or iron, does anybody know the symbol? Yeah. It's going to be FE, right? So then you go, well, where the hell does the FE come from, right? And I'll do that. Once in a while, I'll drop a, a weak curse word. It, <laughs> it catches their attention, all right? Um, they're listening. And so this brings up a really important lesson because I need them to know elements 1 through 20, their names and symbols. Not necessarily where they are on the table, but I need them to be familiar with these building blocks because we're going to use them. Um, and so carbon's obvious. Carbon is C. Calcium is CA. Phosphorus is P. Um, FE stands from the iron word for iron. It's uh, ferrum, right? And so it's shortcutted ferrum. In the body, where do we find iron? It's in your blood more specifically. It's in your hemoglobin, right? So you need iron to transport oxygen. That's how we live, all right? Um, does anybody know Na? Sodium, sodium very good. Um, sodium is, uh, in Latin, is natrium, right? So that's how you get the Na. If I give you K, potassium. potassium. So it comes from the Latin for calcium. And then in the body, does anybody know where you find these? Say again? They're moving in and out of neurons. Yeah, they're all over the place. Um, they're good electrolytes. You find them in pumps, right? You guys know about pumps and things like that. But um, I like to point out to the students electrolytes, right? If you hear the word electrolyte, what particle comes into mind? The electron, right? We just learned about the electron, right? And so I try to always connect, right? We're learning this. We're talking about that. But I like to go back once in a while and just remind them. And so electrons generate electricity when they move. Um, we are, as humans, bioelectrical chemical machines, right? And so we run on electrical currents. Every time you move a muscle, you're sitting here texting or writing or running, whatever, right? You're using um, not necessarily the elements, but you're using different versions called ions. And your body uses these to control muscle movement, right? And we run on electrical currents. There's a reason if you have a heart attack and your heart stops, you're going to get hit with a defibrillator. That's a lot of electrical, uh, electricity to try to make things happen again. And so we need these electrolytes in our body to function properly. And then I like this one. Does anybody know the symbol for platinum? Oh, cheater. <laughs> um, that's PT, that's platinum. And so this one, um, this one's a little bit of a stretch on my part, um, but this is used in an anti-cancer drug. All right, and so this is my point. I just went through this example. We're having fun, right? I want to make a comfortable environment. I want you to feel comfortable speaking up, right? I'm not going to shoot you down. I want to hear what you have to say. Um, sometimes students say something, and I, that gives me an opportunity to correct them, right? And so you got to do that in the right way. Um, but also, it reinforces a point. These are just some of the elements, but do they all do the same thing? What do you notice? Do, can you use any element for any purpose? Right, and the answer is no. Every element, because it has its own structure, so many protons and neutrons and electrons, you can only do them for certain things. So for example, if you tried to substitute calcium into hemoglobin in place of iron, you would die. Right? It wouldn't work. Okay? Um, if you tried to make, um, maybe use platinum as an electrolyte in the body, not so much a good idea. All right, I don't recommend that. Okay? It's not going to work. And so then we can recognize that the element itself is different from other elements, but that depends on how many protons you have in the atom, right? So if I keep going, there's another term I'd like to introduce you to, and this is an isotope. And so isotopes are cool. They're like flavors, right? So how many people like ice cream? Fantastic, me too. It's one of my uh, sweet tooth things. So an isotope, by definition, is an atom with the same number of protons but a different number of neutrons. And so it turns out, because these things are heavy, um, they have mass in the atom, if you add the number of protons to the number of neutrons, now remember, these things sit in the nucleus. Whoop. Okay. Um, if these things sit in the nucleus and you add them together, that's what gives the mass to the atom. Okay. So we're learning some things. Um, the number of protons changes the element. Right? What is it? Is it carbon or calcium or iron? But then you can get flavors of elements. There are types of hydrogen or carbon, and that depends on how many neutrons you have in the nucleus, right? And so we can start changing structures by adding in new particles or taking them away, and then you change properties and what you can do with them. So, for example, there are three flavors to hydrogen. We call them protium, deuterium, and tritium. I would like you to think about these as flavors of vanilla ice cream. This is your uh, generic vanilla ice cream at the grocery store. This is your French bean vanilla. Right? And then this is the um, French vanilla. Nope. Be is it vanilla bean? 
Vanilla bean ice cream, that's your French vanilla. I don't like vanilla ice cream, sorry. <laughs> so, I'm a sherbet guy, so, so be Okay, so here's the problem. You got flavors, right? You don't want to go to the grocery store and accidentally pick up uh, the, bean, uh, the vanilla bean ice cream when you want French vanilla, right? There may be different things, okay? They're pretty similar, but there's a little differences. So how do you tell them apart, right? You guys know to read the label. So as a scientist, right, we're going to label them. And so I'm going to introduce you guys to a general form. And we call this the isotope notation form. There are three parts. I'm going to color code them so we can follow along. X is the symbol, right? Instead of talking about element two, I'm going to use the symbol HE. Um, this Z, drop my stick. This Z is that atomic number. That's the number of protons you have in the atom. And sometimes we don't uh, write that number. I'll show you an example. And that A is the atomic mass. So I would ask you, does anybody remember where do I find the atomic number? So we learned it on the last slide. Where could I find the atomic number? Give me some help, Kelly. Yeah, you look on the periodic table, right? So the periodic table tells us the number of the atom. And on the last slide, I just told you that the atomic mass is the number of particles in the nucleus. So I do this with my students, right? It seems like a simple idea. We have this little sphere, and everything is made of these little spheres. But it can get confusing, because now not only do you have to worry about this sphere, but you got to worry about all the little spheres inside that sphere, right? And so it becomes a little bit more complicated. And so I could apply this notation to these different species. So for example, if I look at protium, this is the hydrogen that you and I are used to. Um, this protium has one proton, so I'm going to put a little number one in the lower left-hand corner in orange. Instead of calling it element one, I'm going to call it hydrogen, so I use the symbol H. And then you'll notice that is the only particle I have in the middle, right? It's only one proton. So then my atomic mass is also one, okay? There's only one thing worth mass. Now if I come over to deuterium, this is heavy hydrogen. It's still a hydrogen atom. It still has one red sphere in the nucleus, so I write a one in orange here. But now you have two particles. I've now added a neutron into the nucleus. I have two things worth mass in the nucleus, so I'm going to put a little two here as a superscript on the left-hand side. And then tritium is a very same story. I have one proton. I can look at that bottom left number, so there's one red sphere. I've added two neutrons, so now there are three particles total. And so I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to put a three there as a superscript. All right, and so these are some notations. So I'm going to stop here are there, or ask you a question. Are there any questions about what I'm talking about? Right, we're learning chemistry on a Friday. That's a beautiful thing. All right. OK. I will tell you that there are different types of isotopes. This is a plot. So I will start talking with students how to analyze data, how to organize data, and read all these different figures or whatever. And so for example, um, on the x-axis here, I have the number of protons. So this would be like hydrogen or helium, lithium, beryllium, boron. This table goes all the way out to argon, element number 18. What you'll notice is there's different boxes above each element, and those are the different isotopes. And so this y-axis, that's going to tell us how many neutrons are in there. But what I wanted to draw your attention to is the blue and the red. And so some combinations, and this is pretty cool, some combinations of protons and neutrons are stable, and we call those non-radioactive combinations, or non-radioactive nuclei. The red one, that's a bad combination. So when you put two neutrons in with that one proton into hydrogen, it becomes unstable. We call that radioactive, and it's going to start breaking down. Okay, and so it's going to try to turn into something that it wants to be, something more stable. All right. So here's a review. You guys have a periodic table in front of you. We've learned that this whole number on the periodic table, that's known as the atomic number, and that's how many protons you have. That's what makes our elements unique. We have the symbol, so instead of using a number, we're going to call them by their name. Right? And then there's this thing in blue, all those, that uh, decimal. We're going to ignore that. We're going to come back to that in Monday's class. Right? Yeah. All right, so here we go. I want to put this to the test. I want to see what you guys have learned. Right? You guys are the students. You have not taken chemistry in a while. That's OK. Most of our students have either, right? We've got to get them up to pace. And so we're going to do an exercise. I'm going to do the first one with you. And then I'm going to have you guys fill out the rest of the table as a group. I want you to do like a think, pair, share thing. And so if I was looking here at carbon 12, and you'll notice there's no number in the lower left-hand corner, I'm going to tell you that this carbon has six protons. I know that because I look at my periodic table. I look at element carbon, it's element C, and I see a six in that box. So that means there's six protons there. 
can somebody please tell me if my mass is 12, how many neutrons do I have to have? You have to have six, right? So I must have 12 things in the nucleus. If six of them are protons, six of them must be neutrons. Okay? And then here's the curveball question. Does anybody remember how many electrons are in an atom of carbon-12? It's also six, right? And so there's a little note if you go back two slides. Um, the number of protons in an atom is the same as the number of electrons. So whatever you have for protons, you have to have for electrons. All right, so I want you guys to take three minutes. This is what I would do with my students. Please take three minutes, talk with each other, fill out this table. I want to see what you can come up with. All right, let's see what you guys have learned. Let's come on back together and let's see what we can do. And so um, what I'd like to say here, um, okay, so we did an example. This is what I would do. I would talk around and I'm asking, how are you guys doing? I hear things like, I'm struggling. I don't know. I don't get it. But that's okay, right? That's part of the learning process. You're not going to get it the first time. It just takes some effort. And so I remind my students, right, um, classes are hard. They take time. What we're doing in the classroom is a guide, right? I'm trying to introduce you to stuff, but you've got to do stuff on your own. So a lot of students end up coming to my office, right? We start talking about things. I get a lot of emails. I try to explain stuff with them. And then if I recognize that somebody is struggling, I'm not even going to give more examples on the spot. I'll make something up, right? Or we'll go back and review, right? And so I try to feel the room um, about how people are feeling about those types of things. And then I got a good question. It's um, how do I, like, convey all this information, essentially, and make sure I'm not pushing the students too fast? How do you control the pace, I guess? And so a lot of the stuff I'm sharing with you on the slide, I'm actually writing on the board. So I do a lot of board work. I usually only use the slides for things like tables. And so as I'm writing a definition or I'm explaining a concept, I'm actually repeating it three times. So if I'm giving a definition, I say it at least three times total. And what I found is that gives me enough time. I'm not going too fast. Um, and it gives them enough time to write everything down so they're not rushing through something. Right? And so those are little things I found that have helped. Um, but a lot of this stuff is on the board, and so they're pretty much writing whatever I want them to write down. So I want to do this with you guys, because um, I know we're running out of time here. And so if I'm carbon-13, how many protons do I have in my nucleus? All right, it's going to be six. It's a carbon. It doesn't matter. It's always going to have six protons. So what does that mean about my number of neutrons, then? All right, it's got to be seven. So you'll notice your mass is 13 here. So the mass is one more. Okay? And so you must have one extra particle in the nucleus. I can't change the number of protons, because then that would be a whole new element. The only thing I can change in the nucleus is the number of neutrons. So it goes up by one. And then my number of electrons would be six. All right. If I'm a bromine atom, how many protons do I have? 35. OK, very good. So you find bromine on the periodic table. BR is in the box with labeled number 35. So it must have 35 protons. How many neutrons do I have? 44. I always like that because some students go, uh, let me take out my phone real quick. Let's <laughs> do the calculation. Right? You got 79 things in the nucleus. If 35 of them are protons, then the other 44 must be neutrons. Right? And then how many electrons do I have? 35. Okay. Are there any questions so far how I got these numbers? All right. Here we go. You ready? How many protons do I have if I'm bromine 81? 35. If I, how many neutrons do I have? 46. You'll notice your mass is two more, so you must have two extra particles. So I must have 46 neutrons. And then electrons? 35. Okay. So what I might do at this point, right, is we've talked about isotopes. At this point, I'm going to try to make it real world for them. Okay. We've covered this topic. All right, maybe you're getting it, but do you care about it? And so I try to make them care. I always try to do at least uh, two real world examples in every chapter or per topic. That way they can see why we're learning this material. Um, and that's, I think, kind of connects it together. Cool, we learned this, but that's how I use it, and I like that more, right? And so then maybe they'll care to learn the material a little bit more, hopefully. So, for example, I might talk about things like medical imaging. Um, there's a thing called a half-life, and it's how fast those unstable nuclei break down over time. And so you can use really long half-life species, something like carbon-14 or uranium-235, to date objects, right? Because things have been in the ground in a while, right? You can actually figure out how long they've been around. Um, you can use moderate half-lifes in blue. So maybe on the day scales, it takes a couple of days for things to break down. So you can use things like phosphorus-32 or iodine-131, like radiotherapy, right? You guys have heard of chemotherapy, right? Radiotherapy maybe is not so much. 
Um, but radiotherapy is therapy using radiation, right? the products that break down from unstable nuclei. So if you take the time to understand which combinations are not stable, then we can study them. We figure out what they give off when they break down, and then we can say, okay, well, if this thing is a beta uh, decay emitter, or a beta emitter, then we can use that to treat leukemia. Right? And now there's a purpose for learning this material. Right? Um, and then we can use short-term things for maybe imaging. So you can use uh, radioactive sodium or technetium-99 to scan the body and get an image in different ways. All right. So I think that's kind of the point I wanted to make here is I have to show them this material. I'm going to explain what I want them to know about the chemistry. I'm going to do some practice problems. I'm going to let them either work through it together or work individually. But then I'm always going to try to bring it back with something that's real world. And that way they understand why I'm doing this. I'm not just doing and talking about chemistry because I find it fun. I do. I'll talk chemistry all day long. But there's got to be a purpose for it, right? And so that's what I try to do in my classroom. And so a lot of people think nuclear. And so I could go ahead and bring up nuclear bombs. We could talk about nuclear reactors. So now we can just start discussing societal issues. Um, nuclear chemistry is not always a bad thing, right? Bombs are obviously devastating. But you can use those nuclear reactions, those nuclear uh, radioactive things, to produce energy, right? Or you can use them for medical purposes to do good rather than bad, right? And so I try to weigh those things get over that preconception that all chemicals are bad for you, right? Because some are good, right? And so we have to understand that. Um, and so what I wanted to do here, because I know I'm running out of time. If you guys will give me two more minutes, I just wanted to kind of show you something here. And so I think it's probably one of the cooler demos I can do. And so what I would do after I start talking about compounds or I stop talking about uh, molecules we can start talking about reactions. And so I'm going to change gears here. And this is kind of a different day, a different class, actually. And so what I might do is I might give them a question. And I might say, we just finished a chapter. Here's a really random question. If I give you three glow sticks, one at each different temperature, I'm going to give you a cold glow stick, a room temperature glow stick, and a hot glow stick. Which one would be the dimmest in the amount of light it gives off? Any ideas? Can I get a volunteer? I'm getting old, so I can't really hear you that well. Cold. I hear cold. Okay. So I like to do this by show of, hand, uh, show of hands. How many people think the coldest glow stick would be the dimmest glow stick? Okay. How many people think the room temperature would be the dimmest? The hot temperature would be the dimmest? Okay. How many people have no idea? <laughs> and that's why we're in school. All right? So we're going to learn something. There is no better way to learn than to do a demo. Right? And so I try to bring in demos whenever I can. I did bring glow sticks with me. So, do you guys want red or yellow? Red. Fantastic. That was easy. Wow. Okay. Yeah, that was like really, I thought it was going to be a split, but here's what I'm going to do. You guys know glow sticks, right? So I'm just going to crack this one open. Okay, so we'll mix it up. I'm going to break this one. As I've been talking here, I have a beaker. This beaker is at about... 55 degrees Celsius, so I'm a little bit under the 60 mark. I'm going to drop that one in there. And then I have with me liquid nitrogen. Um, maybe I should have showed you this before I turned the lights off. <laughs> um, liquid nitrogen is incredibly cold. Right now it's sitting at 77 Kelvin, which is negative 196 degrees Celsius. That's uh, negative 320 degrees Fahrenheit. It is incredibly cold. It is just a liquid. All right, um, but it's a very cold liquid. And so I'm going to take this last glow stick here. We're going to crack that open. And we're going to drop it in. All right, and as it does it, I'm going to make a joke. This is my favorite joke. Choo-choo. <laughs> I'm like a bocce chef, all right? So, uh, <laughs> and so what I'm going to do, I'm going to leave that in there for a minute. Um, the walls are kind of thick, right? It's a plastic. Um, there's a reason for that. The chemicals in there are obviously toxic to humans, so the makers don't want you breaking them open and eating them because that would be bad. Um, but also during the process, glow sticks actually produce a gas, and gases expand. And so we want a thick plastic wall. Um, that way they don't burst open because that would also be bad. And so the problem, though, is it takes a little bit to cool down and heat up because plastic is not really good at uh, transferring heat. So we're going to give this a minute. OK, this is my room temperature. Glow stick sitting right here. I think this one's about ready. I'm going to do a side-by-side. -side. I'm going to try to get out of the projector light. 
What do you guys notice? All right. So this is the hot one. It's a lot brighter. This is the room temperature one. It's a little bit dimmer. You ready to see the cold one? Can I get it? I got it. He's fishing it out. Woo! He is cold. It will not stay in my tongs. No light at all. All right? And so I'm going to open a chapter this way. And I'm going to say, why is this this way? Right? What does that mean? And so now they got something to think about. Hopefully I've hooked them because I've shown them a glow stick. I'll give the glow sticks out so that you guys walk away with something. All right? Does anybody have a birthday this week? Oh. It's like a parting gift. And so I could go ahead um, and I could say, okay, well, we know the, glow, the cold glow stick is the uh, dimmest. Why? So then we start getting into things, well, temperature is energy, right? It's a measure of energy. So what can I do with that? I can actually bring in the chemical reaction and I can show you, well, um, there's a chemical called phenyl oxalate and it's in the tube. And when you crack that thing open, you're actually releasing hydrogen peroxide. So you're starting the reaction. And so it's going to do this thing where it's going to change into, you guys see this square right here? This is a really unstable form of this molecule. It doesn't like to be in a square. And so it's actually going to snap open and it produces carbon dioxide, just gas molecules like you and I exhale. But when it breaks open, it releases energy, and there's a dye in there that likes to emit light when it's excited. And so now all of a sudden, we can give out light from this process, right? So it's kind of like two reactions uh, banking on each other, right? Um, and so that's the glow stick um, I wanted to kind of share with you guys. Um, and just real quick, I know uh, I'm almost out of time. Um, I also try to teach outside the classroom, right? And so I think that's an important aspect. And so um, Rich and I have an internship where we do science communication. So that's the book that uh, we're writing. Um, the American Chemical Society liked this symposium we put together on science communication so much. They asked us to write a book on it, right? And so we have students making infographics as ways to um, explain knowledge to other people. I'll bring students in and I'll let them design chemical experiments for my upper level lab. So they get the practice. Right now I have a chemistry major and she wants to be a professor one day. So this is great practice. You have to conceptualize, design, fine tune all these different experiments. You have to get in the lab and use your skills. Um, you have to think about how the students are gonna take what you give them in terms of a lab manual, how they're gonna interpret it. You have to make a prep sheet so we can prepare. I make her give me instructor data. I have her do safety issues like waste management. So I try to bring all these things we've been talking about into one project. And the students seem to think that's very favorable. Um, with that, um, I have some key takeaways, and this is the slide I wanted to end on, and I appreciate it it's giving me a couple extra minutes. I hope that glow stick thing bought me a couple minutes. Um, and so this is kind of what I've learned when I was reflecting on my own work and how, what I wanted to kind of say with you. These are kind of the key points, and of course they're on the slides in front of you, but what I try to do um, is I try to take advantage of small teaching practices, making things like a comfortable environment. I learn all of my students' names every semester, whether it's 60 students or 16 students. I memorize all of their names and faces. And so if somebody raises their hand, I call them out, right? And so I'm over 100 names every semester I have to learn. But I think it's worth it, because then they feel more comfortable, I think. Um, I like to make jokes, usually at my own uh, cost, right? But it works. It makes people feel a little bit more comfortable, I think. I'm clear with the students. I tell them day one, this chemistry class is one of the hardest, if not the hardest classes you're gonna take this semester. And I need that dedication from you, right? So I try to be upfront with that. I encourage questions. I give what I call John points. And then they go, who the hell is John? Um, I'm John. <laughs> and so um, you guys seen that show, Whose Line Is It Anyway? Right, yeah, the points are made up, they just don't matter. Uh, but I like to do that. I gave, you know, Dominic got seven points today. They're kind of like self-edification points. And so I've actually noticed students, they start competing with each other and they want points even though they're not for anything, they just want them. <laughs> and, and so I think it helps have a discussion. Um, I try to be empathetic, right? I was 18 once. Did I understand chemical kinetics and the reaction of phenyl oxalate and hydrogen peroxide when I was that age? Hell no, right? Definitely not. Um, but what I will do right, is I have to keep that in mind, right? I didn't know this when I was their age, why should they, right? And so I'm gonna try to be real with myself I'm like, okay, well, what is a better way to say this, right? Let's not lose my patience or let's not get upset that they're not getting something. They're not going to get everything right off the bat, right? So let's try an alternate way. I try to know at least three ways to say the same thing in case they don't get it the first way. I'll try to rephrase and come from a different angle, right? And that way I can make sure that they're trying to get it. 
and I'll sit there for an hour until they do. I have no problem doing that, right? I love talking chemistry. So the idea of using positives, right? Um, let's put all those ideas together, right? Maybe they only got a piece of it. Let's combine. Um, you're close, but did you consider trying this, right? So maybe it gives them something to think about without feeling like they were wrong. Um, I try to reflect and be adaptable. So there have been lectures, and I'm writing something on the board, and I'm like, that was the dumbest way to write that down. And so now they have it. I can't backtrack now. It's too late. And so I'll go right back to my office, and I will white out that line on my notes, and I will rewrite whatever I, should, I think I should have said. Right? So I'm constantly changing my notes, um, thinking of different ways, trying to bring in different examples. Um, I listen to student feedback. I keep a running list on my computer from my student evaluations. If they say something and they think it might be good, um, students wanted quizzes before exams to see if they knew something. So I started writing all these chapter quizzes in D2L. Um, and I give them something to try to see if they're ready for the test. Right? And so I try to be amenable. But at the end of the day, you have to have fun. Dr. Burmeister, when I was an undergrad, he said, John, you do best what you love the most. I love chemistry. I love being in the classroom and sharing that knowledge. I'm going to have fun doing it. I'm going to make jokes. and I'm going to try to enjoy it and show them things that capture their attention. Um, and I hope you guys have selling that today. And I hope you've seen some of these points that I wanted to make with you. I just like to acknowledge some people, because um, I am out of time. I got my whole department. Start are Aubrey Dyer and Rich Singeiser. These are my mentors, right, because I'm um, almost done with them because I'm coming up for P&T soon. Uh, um, and so I appreciate you guys always. I just wanted to kind of single you out. Um, Sideria Holmes is our lab manager. She always helps when I need something for class. It's not me, right? And, that's, um, and I know I'm up here. Um, and it's a lot of pressure to say you're a, you know, a good teacher. Can you talk? Um, and I've been super nervous all week, and I keep getting this pit. But it's not just me, right? You have people like the CAS. Right, they're the tutors. There you go, Mary. Um, we have SIs. We have the students coming together to help other students. Right, it, you know, it takes a village. Um, I gotta thank the dean, right, for funding opportunities. So the mini grant and the UCARE grant that he's been offered, it's helped us give our students more exposure to different things. Let me try different things. I gotta thank Michelle Furlong because she actually hired me um, before we split into two departments. She was still the chair of natural sciences, um, and she's always been there with an ear, or encouragements, or words of advice, and I appreciate that. Um, I got to thank my PhD advisor, Misha. He's like my second dad. Um, and of course, my wife, because she'd be mad if I didn't thank her. <laughs> and so I wanted to thank you guys for attending and participating. Um, I do appreciate it. I hope I kind of shared some points. Thank you very much.